today is already the last installment of our seminar series um, for this academic year. Um, so hopefully we'll be back uh, next year. Um, and I think today is going to be a really great uh, seminar that's summarizing a lot of the things and relates to a lot of the things that we're also working on in City Ready. Um, so we're really excited to have uh, Michaela Trippel here from uh, the University of Vienna. Um, where she is a professor in uh, geography and regional research. Um, and she's also a professor at the University of Akta in uh, Norway. Um, so as usual, um, Michaela has um, around 40, 45 minutes to present. Um, and then we'll leave the Q&A to the end. So um, I'll just raise your hand in the end and I'll ask you to unmute or type your question in the chat if that's if that's easier and then um, we can have the discussion. Um, so without further ado, I'll just uh, give it over to Michaela on her presentation on uh, place-based innovation policies in an era of grand societal challenges. Yeah, thanks a lot, uh, Caroline. So many thanks for inviting me and uh, thanks a lot for the kind introduction. Uh, my talk is on place-based innovation policies and on how we could reorient or reinvent regional innovation policies in light of uh, grand societal challenges. And I will also talk a bit um, on how a rethinking of the regional innovation systems approach could uh, contribute here. So if we go to the next slide. Thanks. Um, so then, then let me start by setting the scene. Um, we are, and this is well known, uh, living in very challenging times, right? So many regions are currently confronted with multiple crises that pose significant uh, transformation challenges. So transformation challenges that result from problems and uh, dynamics that have been unfolding um, for some time, like the ongoing climate warming emergency, resource depletion, uh, and other environmental problems, or the fourth industrial revolution driven by artificial intelligence, new materials, advanced uh, digital platforms, and so on. And there are growing uh, inequalities and new uh, geopolitical tensions. And there are not only these, um, you know, these slow burn changes, regions are also facing sudden shocks that require uh, responses and uh, restructuring uh, efforts. So just think of wars like the, the one in, in the Ukraine or the ongoing uh, coronavirus pandemic. There are some experts uh, say that with, you know, continuing uh, degradation of ecosystems, even stronger viral outbreaks than COVID-19 are to be expected. So, and given all these, uh, these challenges and, and crises of, of uh, climate change, COVID-19, inequality, uh, there is a, a growing view that regions and that policymakers uh, should take the opportunity not to build uh, back uh, um, better, but as, as Ron Martin noted in a recent paper, to build forward better to a new regime of economic and social development that tackles the, the present problems and, and crisis. So regions are confronted with the need to build up capacities for transformative resilience, so to build sustainable structures and pathways in response to grand societal challenges. And we also know that, well, regions differ quite a bit in their capacity for such a purpose-driven restructuring, purpose-driven uh, transformation. And uh, some might fail, so they, they might be at risk of being left behind, suffering from, from multiple problems, ecological, economic, social, political ones, with um, um, social and political discontent being really serious issues um, as the emerging uh, debate on the geography of, uh, of discontent clearly shows. So uh, next slide, please. Yeah. So we need uh, to build sustainable structures and pathways uh, in response to grand societal challenges. We are told that we should strive for transformations that are to the benefit of society uh, and the 
uh, environment. And it's quite interesting to see that, that such a view is also gaining currency in the policy world. So our policy landscapes are in transition. And these changes um, are inspired by or informed by a new scientific um, frame for innovation policy. So in particular, mission-oriented uh, a mission-oriented policy approach. No? advocated by Marianne Mazzucato needs to be mentioned here, but also transformative innovation policies. So Schott and Steinmüller did a, did a wonderful job in their highly cited paper from 2018, where they really showed now how the, the para innovation policy paradigm needs to change if we want to cope with current challenges. And some of these, um, uh, some elements of, uh, of this new frame uh, have been taken up um, in the policy world, for example, at the EU level. So just think of the European Green Deal, Europe's contribution to uh, the sustainable, uh, sustainable development goals, or the so-called EU missions, such as ad adaptation to climate change. And uh, next slide, please. There is also the recovery and resilience facility that uh, aims to promote, among other things, uh, green transitions, sustainable and inclusive growth, uh, and social and territorial cohesion. So, uh, next slide, please. Yeah, but what about uh, the regional uh, policy level? Well, there are, as you might know, growing uh, calls for uh, refocusing uh, place-based innovation policies. Uh, uh, more and more scholars who uh, argue that um, regional innovation policy should be reoriented to the base grand societal challenges. They should embrace sustainability course. And there are um, a number of recent uh, uh, academic pieces that, that, that outline new directions for place-based policies. They, they outline frameworks for uh, problem-oriented regional um, uh, industrial policies and challenge-oriented uh, regional uh, innovation policies. And there are a number of policy reports no, that stress the need or the, the opportunity to combine the, the regional innovation policy paradigm of smart specialization with the goals of the Euro uh, European Green Deal uh, and uh, the SDGs. So there is this well-known study by Phil McCann and, and Luke Söte on place-based innovation for sustainability, um, published by the JRC, and the Partnerships for Regional Innovation Playbook um, just came out, it makes a really strong argument huh, uh, in favor of um, moving from smart specialization towards smart specialization for sustainability. So uh, next slide, please. A um, key question is, of course, uh, what, what theories and what concepts and what empirical insights uh, could inform such policy approaches, you know, policy approaches that embrace sustainability. Um, and, and what could the geography of um, uh, innovation uh, literatures um, really contribute to a reorientation of innovation policy? So to what, to what extent can we uh, build on scholarship in the field of the geography of innovation? To what extent do we need to move beyond that conventional wisdom, beyond the state of the art? And let me be a bit uh, provocative. Um, my argument is that the geography of innovation scholarship is not very well equipped to inform the policy shifts that I outlined before. And this is because it is based on a uh, conventional understanding of innovation, one that is not uh, up to the challenges of our time. So we need an alternative pers perspective, a reassessment, a rethinking of uh, dominant uh, approaches. Uh, next slide, please. So in, in what follows, I will focus on the, on the regional innovation system approach, which is um, one of the dominant approaches in the field and the one that I am uh, most uh, familiar with. And it's a very popular approach, no? um, an approach that has been widely used to, to map and analyze the, the place-based structures and dynamics that generate a 
highly uneven distribution of innovation activities uh, across space. And uh, has also inspired uh, policymakers to design and implement systemic tailor-made uh, strategies to enhance the innovation performance of, of regions. And uh, smart specialization is an excellent example here. Huh? Just think of the, the widespread um, adoption of smart specialization in European regions and, and in other parts of, of the world. Um, yeah, next slide, please. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so it's a very popular approach, but given the challenges of our time, we need to ask a number of uh, critical questions. Um, and let's start with the question, what is in the focus of risk studies and policies? Well, the, the regional innovation system approach um, pays, and I think this is well known, pays a lot of attention to how uh, firms and industries supported by uh, partners in the higher education sector and in um, uh, government sector, influenced by institutional configurations, generate innovation that enhances the, uh, com competitiveness um, uh, of the regional economy and boosts economic growth. And this deserves indeed a number of critical questions, right? And the first one concerns uh, the view or the, the underlying implicit or explicit uh, assumption about the purpose of innovation. So the uh, traditional risk approach uh, clearly emphasizes economic growth and competitiveness as the purpose of innovation. And this is at odds with a new understanding of innovation, one that doesn't limit the purpose of innovation to fostering growth, but uh, to, to solve uh, societal problems. Another critique would be that uh, the traditional risk approach centers too much attention to uh, technological um, innovation, innovation in the corporate sector. And it leaves other innovation types, such as social innovation, user innovation, institutional innovation. Um, so innovation types that um, emerge not only in the economic sector, but also in other sectors, such as the public sector, civil society, regional and urban communities. Um, so it leaves these, uh, uh, those types of, um, of innovation uh, aside. And it shows a very strong focus on the positive uh, effects of innovation and little is said about the negative effects, for example, for the environment and the society. And there is little discussion on who benefits from innovation. Um, and let's move on and let's take a look at the, the extra constellations. So, uh, and here again, uh, this is um, um, a view or a focus that deserves critique because the, the risk approach shows a um, strong focus on uh, triple helix actors no? and the institutions that influence their activities and uh, their networking patterns. And it neglects um, other innovation actors, other stakeholders such as users or civil society organizations, the affected um, interest groups, the most vulnerable groups in, uh, in, uh, in regions. So and there is really little discussion on, on what role these non-triple helix actors uh, could play in the innovation process and what, what role uh, they could play in, in policy uh, processes. So and the last point, the last critique um, is that um, risk studies have, have long focused on the supply side of innovation, so explaining where uh, innovation is generated in technological, sectoral, and of course, geographical spaces. And less attention has been paid to the application side. So this is how regions use and apply innovations generated in the region or elsewhere uh, to solve uh, concrete problems on the ground. So uh, the factors that influence the regional application capacities. So the capacity to anchor and embed uh, solutions uh, are often um, blind spots in, in risk study. So it's a, a narrow and uncritical understanding uh, of innovation. We are uh, 
uh, confronted with. So uh, next slide. So and uh, together with um, uh, Franz Döttling and, and Veronika Desch, um, we have um, just recently come up with, with some ideas or with some suggestions of how the, the, the risk approach could be revisited uh, and modified. So we have begun to develop what we call a, a challenge-oriented regional innovation system approach. And this is an approach that, uh, that seeks to bring the, the risk concept and risk policies in closer touch with an alternative understanding of innovation. And in the paper with uh, Franz and uh, Veronica, we have really tried to, to reorient the, the concept and policies, uh, risk policies to a new purpose of innovation. It's solving place-based problems, challenges, uh, and needs. And uh, here we could tie in with recent discussions. Some scholars uh, argue that there is not only a geography of innovation, there is also a geography of problems or a geography of, of challenges. Um, so different regions uh, have different exposures to environmental and societal challenges. They face different uh, uh, problems. Uh, grand societal challenges manifest themselves in different ways, depending uh, on the spatial context, the regional context under consideration. And uh, this is the reason why innovation activities need to be tailored to the, uh, to the local context, to the subnational context. And there are these, uh, you know, uh, uh, arguments on the directionality, a new directionality for regional uh, innovation uh, policy, where uh, now more and more scholars argue that um, uh, region-specific challenges or place-specific challenges, problems and needs should be key motivations for interventions. So uh, big problems um, and, and not sectors. And um, this is important uh, when it comes to the prioritization, policy priori prioritization processes. Um, it's important to, as a, to, to, to note that um, uh, prioritization should uh, should not um, uh, only be based on entrepreneurial opportunities, but also on, on place specific problems and needs. So we go to the, to the next slide, please. Oh, okay. But what is the COVID approach, a challenge oriented uh, regional innovation uh, system approach, and how does it differ from the uh, conventional approach? So let's start with the, the purpose and the direction of innovation. Um, here, uh, our argument is that the, the CORIS approach uh, adopts a broader view on, um, and complements the, uh, the orientation on economic uh, growth and competitiveness uh, by a focus on uh, place-based problems and needs. And addressing these problems requires consideration of a more diverse set of um, innovation types, innovation actors, and a nuanced view on the, on the innovation uh, outcomes. So uh, with regard to the types of, of innovation, it's, it's clear that um, here it's important to uh, as we extend the um, traditional orientation on technological uh, innovation to, to other forms of innovation activities such as user innovation, social innovation, uh, institutional innovations, um, and reflect uh, a bit on in which, in which sectors these, uh, these other types of innovations uh, emerge, uh, undertaken by which actors, and in which uh, uh, as well, uh, the sectors in, in, in uh, in, in other sectors than, than the economy uh, and actors that operate at multiple spatial scales. So I think this is important. Um, and uh, yeah, actors, I think I've already mentioned that. Uh, it's, it's important to move beyond the, the usual suspects, uh, the, uh, so firms, university, governments, so-called triple helix, um, and uh, include civil society actors, innovative agents from, from the public sector, uh, users and, and citizens, because these new innovation actors uh, 
are said to play a, a more powerful role than they do in a conventional regional innovation system. So they, it's then, um, important to investigate how they co-shape uh, uh, networks and institutional structures, how they are influenced by evolving networks and institutional structures at multiple scales. And it's very important uh, to uh, have both the supply and application side in focus, no? because uh, challenge-oriented innovation is not only about uh, uh, experimenting uh, with new so solutions, developing new solutions, but the diffusion of upscaling of innovation. Uh, uh, yes, Professor Goddard, including universities, of course, as well. Um, so diffusion and upscaling um, is, um, is really uh, crucial because it's not sufficient to initiate change. Uh, change needs to be consolidated uh, in order to, to make uh, an impact. So um, can we go to the, to the next slide? Okay, so uh, a core is a challenge-oriented innovation system could then be um, defined as the, the wider regional territorial framework that reflects the capacity of regions to address um, a different uh, place-specific problems uh, uh, and challenges, and some of them might be uh, interrelated. And um, so this capacity of regions to address challenges uh, could then be studied by as well, which actors are mobilized in order to uh, address a, a specific challenge, uh, which uh, as well, mobilizing existing actors, but also including new, uh, new actors. Uh, one needs to study how uh, existing networks are mobilized and which new networks um, um, are formed, how network, networking patterns change, how uh, actor constellations change, how power structures uh, change, um, and um, some to say uh, how also how when, when we think about institution, uh, how existing institutional configurations could be mobilized, but also how uh, um, different actors engage in, in institutional uh, institutional change. So uh, this is the thing that uh, we believe uh, needs to be studied. And it, it goes without saying that, um, uh, that um, of course, national and supranational contexts matter as well. So this core is, is nested in, in, in larger system. And it's uh, interesting to study now as well how, for example, assets are imported from other regions, how translocal uh, uh, learning networks are formed. Uh, one needs to, uh, to, to study, to, as we examine regulatory structures and what impact they have on challenge-oriented innovation, how actors navigate um, um, complex uh, multi-governance settings to, to mobilize funding, for example. So uh, next slide, please. So then, um, let's turn uh, from the from the concept to to real world uh, contexts, and uh, let us deal with the the question: um, Why and how do we configure real world regional uh, innovation systems? So how could we enhance their challenge orientation? And the why question is the easy one, right? So know that um, majority of uh, historically grown regional innovation systems, the dominant uh, innovation and entrepreneurial activities are often unfit for, um, for addressing environmental and, and, and social challenges. And this is because um, uh, the actors, so both uh, private actors, uh, public actors are often unwilling or are not capable to, tack to tackle place-specific problems. Um, other reason is that established network uh, practices and uh, institutional configurations often constrain green and inclusive innovation. They rather reinforce unsustainable um, pathways. So um, we uh, we need a reconfiguration of um, 
conventionally oriented regional innovation systems to increase the fit uh, of, of risk with societal and environmental goals and uh, to enhance the um, capacity of uh, regional innovation systems to support uh, several core processes of, um, of challenge-oriented innovation. And I will talk about these core processes in, in a second. Um, first, of, uh, before I do that, I would like to uh, make the argument that um, reconfiguring real-world regional innovation systems um, comes with many changes. No? It's not, not only new economic activities, but also reconfiguration of actor constellations, networks, practices, research and education programs, and so on. Uh, institutional change will be an uh, important uh, element or an important dimension of change, new uh, roles of the state. So uh, there is this nice, nice paper by uh, Bo uh, Susanna Boras and Edla, where they show that uh, uh, no, so funding and promotion of networking do no longer sufficient. There are many more new, new uh, roles of the state that uh, needs to be um, um, undertaken. Public administration reforms is uh, also, um, um, I think, a, a key challenge um, uh, that many uh, regions are, are, are facing uh, and a challenge that needs to be met in order to uh, yeah, to, to build up a challenge-oriented innovation system or enhance the challenge orientation of existing ones. So um, if we go to the um, to the next slide. I've already mentioned that uh, there are several core processes of challenge-oriented innovation, and um, I think this is uh, really important because. Um, um, I, usually, we, when we talk about innovation, and I have mentioned that before, we talk about uh, generation of innovation, so experimenting with developing innovation, applying it, upscaling it, and this is um, really important, uh, so no, no doubts about that, but there are other uh, important processes as well. Uh, and um, the, the first one, and I think this is obvious, um, is the identification and uh, framing of place-based uh, problems and regional vulnerabilities. This is tends to be uh, forgotten in some discussions. Um, another key thing or another key process is what could be called unlocking and exnovation. So um, what do we mean by unlocking and exnovation? Uh, this is our, um, processes that are oriented um, towards revealing so that they're unsustainable in the regional innovation system and proactive uh, destabilization, phasing out of unsustainable uh, activities, practices, networks, institutional structures. And this is not um, an, an easy task, so to say. I mean, this, uh, um, there is a lot of resistance, as we know, by in by incumbents, by um, um, by um, by the population, um, and so it it is not an easy process. It involves undermining Western interest and uh, what Brahms uh, et al. have recently called it was really picking the the losers. You know? So and the fourth uh, process is orchestration. Um, so what do we mean by orchestration? So we are looking at um, coordination processes of multi-actor um, 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 multi constellations, so uh, involving stakeholders in innovation processes, in, in policy processes. Uh, it involves um, uh, mediation of different interests, minim minimization of trade-off and conflicts, uh, formulation of shared vision, setting of collective priorities, and of course, uh, uh, horizontal and, uh, and vertical uh, policy coordination. So these are the four core processes that uh, require uh, attention that uh, needs to be studied uh, by uh, COVID's uh, scholarship. 
And um, these are the processes that the real world uh, regional innovation systems need to support. And they are, for their support, we need to, um, to reconfigure um, a historically grown risk. So can we go to the, to the next slide, please? Mm -hmm. So, uh, okay, now we have dealt with the, um, with the why question. We are now turning to the, to the how question. So how to build up or uh, how to build up CORIS or how to strengthen CORIS in, in different places. And in a, in a, a very recent paper, um, we have um, we have made this distinction between two roots of uh, of COVID development. Uh, the first one is the mobilization and reorientation of uh, of existing risk structures. So this is the reorientation route route, um, and the other one is the creation of new challenge oriented structures, the transformation uh, route. And these two routes, they are uh, ideal type uh, routes. So in, in real world policy context, um, COVID development uh, may well show um, features of both uh, routes. No? So, um, these two routes can be seen as the two ends of a continuum uh, where uh, different combinations of reorientation and uh, transformation activities um, are possible. So then uh, next slide, please, please. Mm -hmm. So, but what are these two routes about? Uh, the, the reorientation uh, route um, uh, builds on and mobilizes uh, the assets, actors, networks, and institutional structures of uh, existing regional innovation systems, mobilizes them to develop innovative solutions to place uh, based problems um, and needs. So, so this route is about enhancing the challenge orientation of existing uh, risk elements uh, and, and functions. And it is about the, the reuse or uh, repurposing uh, of, of existing assets. And there are several advantages of taking this, this route. No? As well. If you draw on existing knowledge endowments, uh, industry specialization, uh, other assets, this, this could be beneficial in terms of value and job creation in some places, uh, because uh, we know that uh, as innovation activities, innovation policies um, that tackle place specific uh, problems while creating uh, economic uncertainty could easily face resistance from incumbents and the population and uh, there might be limited um, uh, political legitimacy. So taking the reorientation route could, could help uh, to, to curb potential um, resistance. So uh, some continuity in, in transformative change in the form of building on uh, existing actors and assets. Um, may be important in, in, in some places. So this, this is the reorientation route. The, the transformation route uh, involves uh, the construction of new challenge-oriented uh, risk structures. And it is more about disruption and adding new elements to the, to the risk. So, and following this route entails a, a greater uh, inclusion of new or uh, neglected innovation actors the disruption of um, old networks and the construction of new ones and engagement in institutional uh, change. So this route uh, uh, builds more heavily on the creation or importation of new assets and the destruction of old ones, the facing out of uh, unsustainable uh, uh, practices. Uh, this is the unlocking and uh, exnovation uh, processes that I, I mentioned earlier play a, a really prominent uh, uh, role here. Um, I would also like to add uh, that, of course, uh, proactive um, destabilization could be a highly challenging task. I have already mentioned that. And this might be the reason why um, public and private actors in the innovation system may uh, refine. 
from such a strategy and resort to a layering strategy, which is about attaching new uh, procedures, uh, policies and arrangement to existing ones. Right? So the existing ones that su support current practices. And this could then lead or it will lead to a coexistence of old and new structures, which could of course um, um, curtail a transformative uh, change. So if we go to the, to the next slide. Yeah, thanks. Um, so uh, which route uh, might be taken or be a more precise where to position uh, along the reorientation transformation continuum. Um, well, this depends on, um, on, on many factors. Uh, of course, of the, uh, depends on the place specific problems and challenges. No? Some of the problems might be, uh, might be uh, addressed, could be tackled by not reorienting the existing system, as others might um, uh, call for creation of new structures. So the, the place specific problems and challenges are an important factor. And then of course also the, uh, the configuration of the pre-existing uh, uh, risks. No? And much depends on the historically grown asset based uh, uh, industry specializations, the support structures, institutional configurations, um, and um, also uh, degree of decentralization of governance system and public administration uh, traditions. And if we then take a look at uh, less developed regions, um, and I am uh, looking forward to the discussion with you on that. So if we uh, take a look at less developed regions in centralized regimes to, to make it um, turn this into a, a, a really tough exercise. Then we can see that well, they, so they um, have really a high transformation needs, right? Because uh, the pressure, they have the pressure to build up new structures due to weaker condition, preconditions that there is not uh, that much um, available that could be reoriented. So, uh, a high transformation needs, but the transformation capacities are uh, tend to be very low because um, and this is, is well known that right? they have poorly developed uh, institutional capacities, um, limited autonomy, uh, public administration traditions that um, frustrate uh, um, stakeholder inclusion, uh, and, frustrate in ex innovation dynamics, uh, uh, make it really difficult to take on new policy tasks and so on. So it's, um, it's really a, a, a dilemma. No? And one way to, to, to move forward could be to argue that uh, in, in such places, under such conditions, risk development might rely heavily on the reorientation of existing uh, or by weakly developed structures, but this could be combined with um, creating new structures in policy niches, um, and then uh, one could uh, reflect on how to how one can this uh, then uh, gradually expand over time. So, um, looking forward to the discussion about this. Uh, suggestion with you. Can we go to the, uh, to the next slide? No, we, uh, we skip um, this slide and uh, yeah, um, almost done. Um, some reflection on, uh, on the next steps that, um, that could be taken. The CORIS approach is, um, uh, is one that has just been recently developed. Um, there were some first ideas, some first suggestions that um, can be put up for discussion, but um, we are not really there yet. No? So we need more conceptual work and uh, we need uh, more um, uh, empirical research uh, to come to grips with uh, why some regions uh, 
succeed in, in building up quarries or re reorienting existing risks towards more challenge or orientation, while others fail. So uh, there is more conceptual work needed and, uh, and much more uh, empirical research. And one thing that um, I would find really exciting is that um, in our future work, uh, so we, we want to take a closer look on the benefits and losses related to risk configuration. I think this is really a, a, a crucial issue, not least uh, because, uh, as I mentioned earlier, there um, could be a lot of, um, of resistance. Uh, not only uh, from uh, incumbents, but also from uh, the population, uh, from consumers don't want to give up their lifestyles or whatever. So this would be, I think, um, uh, an exciting uh, thing to do. And uh, another issue that is high on our research agenda relates to the agency dynamics that um, um, that are crucial for uh, core risk development. And here we think or we believe that um, a focus on what is called system level agency uh, is really important. So what are system, what is system level agency? Who are the system level agents? So are agents who challenge dominant views uh, in, the, in the regional innovation system and uh, trigger changes at the system level could result in a reconfiguration. Um, and I think this is, it's important to, to have this focus on these um, agents of change, to understand how, uh, how trig as who triggers uh, these changes at the system level and how, but this is not, um, not sufficient. So this um, perspective or uh, this focus on, of, uh, on change agency needs to be complemented by a focus on consolidation agency because I mentioned that earlier it's not sufficient to initiate change change needs to be consolidated um, and it's I think crucial to understand how how this is how this is done um, and the third th a third form of agency that um, um, uh, matters is a maintenance agency there is some new exciting uh, research out there done by, by Henderson and uh, Charlie and others that uh, really shows that if we want to understand um, um, sustainability uh, transitions in different places, then uh, one really needs to, to pay attention to, uh, to these uh, three different types of agency. And relating this discussion to core development, I think, could be a, um, a very promising thing to do. Um, another, uh, another interesting uh, question or project for the future, so to say, are uh, new risk typologies, because the one that um, we have right now, no, the uh, um, fragmented regional innovation systems and uh, organizationally thick and diversified innovation systems and uh, thick and specialized innovation systems. They, of course, they help us a lot, um, but um, still they provide us with an incomplete picture because uh, they don't cover the, um, but they, they tell us something about the opportunities um, and, uh, um, innovation potentials that regions might have, but they don't tell us anything about a place-based problems and needs and challenges. And they, these things need to be factored uh, in our um, uh, analysis and in our uh, typology development. Um, another important thing is um, that concerns the measurement of challenge-oriented uh, innovation uh, System. So this is really an, a, a very important question. How can we uh, measure the challenge orientation of um, a regional innovation system with what indicators? Um, how can we measure capacities and performance, uh, performance of, of regional innovation systems to tackle uh, place-specific challenges? So as uh, 
number of uh, question marks that um, um, that are um, uh, that, that concern the, the measurement of um, of challenge oriented innovation. And last but not least, I'm um, thinking about uh, um, uh, uh, policies and how policies are. Um, um, designed and implemented on the ground. Um, and now with these new calls for uh, uh, shift from smart specialization to smart specialization for sustainability, I think revisiting and rethinking uh, the methodology for uh, policy proce processes would be um, a really crucial uh, thing to do in the future. Yes, and with that, I stop here and I look forward to your questions and to the discussion. Uh, thanks a lot, Michele. We already have a couple of questions in the chat from uh, John and Lisa. Um, John, do you want to start? Maybe summarize your questions quickly. I have to unmute. Uh, OK, can you see me? Uh, OK, right. Let me go to the full screen. I'm, I'm just sort of goes a full screen. Uh, my question, I think, was a uh, fantastic, you know, blew me away, Michaela, fantastic presentation. So close to where, where I'm at. Um, it, my, my question was, you, you started off by some very interesting points about crises. My first question was the extent to which you think the, um, the pandemic and the reaction to the pandemic has been a stimulus for reviewing and thinking differently about regional innovation systems and taking a broader perspective insofar as the pandemic required bringing together all sorts of different um, skills and, and all sorts of different drivers. It had differential effect on firms of, and business. So the first question is, it, has the pandemic led to some sort of change in how the actors are thinking about their place-based uh, RIS? Mm -hmm. My second point is the bigger one, really, about the situation in what are institutionally thin regions. Um, you talk quite a lot about, um, as it were, vested interests, um, didn't want to change. You could argue, and I, I may be wrong on this, that in a way the, the framework that you're producing is an opportunity for places where there isn't a well-established and locked in, broadly mm -hmm. speaking, conservative RIS. And it could be an opportunity for new approaches and, and new actors to come into the system. And obviously I'm very interested in the role of universities in all of this. It's mm -hmm. quite interesting to see uh, how universities in less strong universities in less behind places without the, the inherited legacy of, of linear innovation and commercialization have been acting in a more fleet of foot way than those in more well-established dominant universities in, in the traditional big cities. So just some propositions to you to, to react to. So two questions. Thank you very much. Yeah, I said, said two fantastic questions, John. Thanks a lot. So on the impact of the pandemic, um, I mean, I can only tell you what our research tells us. No? As we have recently done um, a few studies here in Austria to see whether or not the uh, pandemic has been a catalyst for transformative change for sustainability transitions. And we didn't find any evidence. The, the opposite is true. Right. So we, we have uh, looked at the uh, plastics industry in Labor Austria. Um, um, an industry that has that is struggling a lot, as you can, as you might imagine, not with this uh, growing um, growing consciousness of the, all, all the problems that are created by the production and use of plastics, and so um, the firms and the uh, support organizations and also universities, by the way, uh, they have been experimenting for. Uh, quite a while, I think, uh, more than 10 years or so, uh, with, uh, with bioplastics. Huh? Uh, and, but they always kept it, so that they, they built up some knowledge um, 
and um, um, but but they kept all these activities in, in a niche strategically in a niche uh, while that continuing with their um, business as usual and what we have seen is that the pandemic hasn't um, hasn't led to a, a rethinking uh, at least not in the plastics industry and also not in the construction industry which was another another sector that we have investigated so the opposite was, was true yeah. um, so they um, they felt that um, Maybe the plastic sector is a, is a specific one because there was quite a lot of demand no, for um, for plastic products, but also in the construction sector. What we what we have seen is that uh, there was uh, the pandemic has really boosted uh, um, digital transitions, yes. but not green transitions, uh, at least not in the sectors that that we have investigated. So there was little evidence for. Uh, the pandemic being a catalyst for uh, increasing the challenge orientation um, um, in the um, in lower austria this was our case study region so on the other uh, the other question john uh, institutional thin region uh, uh, as might have um, so to say an advantage in so far as there aren't that many established structures that could constrain change. And I think you are absolutely right. So I don't know if Simon Baumgartner, Baumgartner Seiringer joined today's session is a, a colleague uh, here at the University of Vienna and together with Simon, um, we have um, just recently published a paper in, in regional studies where we make exactly this argument. I will send it to you, John. Thank you. Um, yeah, thanks a lot for that. Um, then there was a question by Lisa. Um, do you want to repeat that? Otherwise I can... No, no, I, um, I'm happy to, to, to um, ask it. Thank you very much, Michaela, for this very, very interesting uh, um, seminar. I thoroughly enjoyed it. And I like the way you're trying to really push the boundary here in understanding how these grand challenges are, have to be somehow, uh, you know, uh, uh, they have to make sense for places. And um, I was wondering whether you could say a bit more about the driving forces behind the transformation route. The, the reason why I'm asking is because there, is a lot, there are a lot of, as we know, you know uh, embedded and vested interest in locations. So what the transformation route seems to be doing is quite a change. And I was wondering whether you had in mind whether, how, how is it going to happen? Or can it happen without, for example, national or international level inputs? Mm -hmm. So how, how is the multi-scholar element uh, coming into, the, into this? Mm -hmm. And um, another question, which is somehow related to that, is whether you could say a bit more about are there really place-based problems, um, in <laughs> a sense? <laughs> and I think I know this is really uh, uh, it's a bit silly, but given the, 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 your, your starting slide, some of the problems are, are really big. And I'm sure they have meaningful regions, but they are big problems. So I just wonder what you could link the grand challenges that we're facing with the idea of, I think very interesting, the idea of place-based problem that you have um, uh, introduced. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Wow, these are tricky questions, Lisa, <laughs> particularly the last one. No, uh, on the, uh, the, the first one on, on the driving forces, uh, I think this is really hard to say. No? Um, it depends on the, on the region under con consideration, on the uh, place-based problem uh, we are talking about. Um, um, again, the, the example, as the, ca the cases I mentioned uh, earlier, uh, uh, the, the plastics industry and the construction sector, and um, 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 partly also the tourism sector. We have also taken a look at the tourism sector. It's, it's a bit a different story, but anyway. So in 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 those cases, um, we have seen that uh, the EU, uh, the Euro European uh, Commission, has really been a, a driving force, and the the 
policymakers at the regional level and in particular at the national level are the constraining forces. No? But a lot of um, impulses are really coming from the uh, from the EU level. But this is only for the cases that that I mentioned earlier. So I wouldn't generalize that. Um, and there are there are other cases where uh, so. Um, uh, looking at, at John, where universities are really uh, in the driving seat of uh, initiating uh, change, and uh, other cases where you know uh, uh, local communities are initiating uh, change. Uh, it, it really depends on the on the on the on the uh, place-based problem we are uh, we are talking about. It's, it's really hard to to come up with an, a, a general answer. Um, and the other one, oh, Lisa, uh, <laughs> not the um, global uh, global challenge, uh, global challenges, and what uh, can we then really talk about about uh, place specific challenges in a meaningful way? I, I, I think we could. Um, I, I mentioned it. I, I mentioned it um, briefly. Uh, so the, the way how we see it is, as we argue that global challenges such as climate change or whatever, manifests itself uh, in different ways, depending uh, on, on, on the region you were looking at. So climate change can mean for a, a region in the, in the global south, something completely different than for a mountain region in Austria and for the Birmingham region. Uh, and so really thinking it through what what do these global challenges uh, and of course they they need to be solved at the uh, through um, international co collaboration so no doubts on this but still thinking it through what global challenges could mean in different territories and which specific problems global challenge then uh, create on the um, on the ground uh, and with what solutions they could be addressed. I think this is the this is the way how how we see it. I don't know if this is a very um, satisfying, Lisa, but um, yeah, this is where where we uh, currently are in our thinking. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks, Lisa and Clela. Um, there was another. Question from Hannah. We have one minute for a quick question and a quick answer. Oops. Oh, hi. Yeah, sorry. The presentation really resonated with some of my research. Um, just to boil the question about measurement down, um, do you think there's new opportunities in environment, social, and government frameworks? Are they just a reformulation of the quantitative bias that is endemic in um, the organizations and institutions we're trying to change? Um, uh, can you say that I didn't quite get the, the question? So the measurement... Um... Sorry, I could, with limited time, I probably skipped ahead. Um, the, there's a new environmental, social and governance frameworks that mm. are shaping how social value is measured by organizations and certainly in my work i've got very interested in how the links between environment and social could be reformulated to encourage less behavioral interventions and more context place-based yeah. interventions but one of the tensions i've got in thinking in this framework is is all we're going to end up doing then reformulating the, the already pre-existing quantitative bias in, in organisations or is there really an opportunity in, in reformulating these frameworks to step them away from quantitative bias to to other measurements that account better for place-based change because they're inherently problematic occurring in an open system mm -hmm. and also where you're often seeking plateaus of stability rather than ongoing change in activation so that's more of a, a shape of my thinking. So to be open and honest with you, I haven't thought about it yet, but I would uh, very much, I would be very grateful uh, if you uh, could send me some some of your papers that that cover what, what you just mentioned. 
I'm just working on my thesis <laughs> so uh, when, when it's in a, in a more together way but I, I'm happy to to Scott correspond I think measurement and um, catalyst getting people to think differently are two key key areas I've honed in on and I really enjoyed the presentation there's a lot of it resonated so thank you Okay, thanks a lot. And um, yeah, Michaela's uh, email address is there. So I think it would be great if you two could, could follow up on that maybe after. Because um, we're unfortunately at the end of the seminar, um, but it was a really interesting talk. Thanks again, Michaela, for um, joining us today. Thanks to everyone else uh, who could come today. And um, I think um, most of you, if you signed up through Eventbrite, you can probably also receive our email newsletter. So you're uh, you'll be notified next year, basically, when we when we start up again. Um, but yeah, thanks a lot for coming today. Um, and yeah, see you then. Thanks. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye.